And now for something completely different. Um, I thought I'd do a dance, but um, <laughs> we leave the victory dance for in a few years. So um, for those of you rats and mice in the audience, we have wonderful news. Can I have a quick count of hands? I can't see anything. If you could raise your hands. One, oh, there are some. OK, great. Thank you. <laughs> OK, well, um, for those of you who are part of this community here of rats and mice, we have wonderful news. If any of you develop brain cancer within the next 10 minutes, come and see us, and we will be curing you in no time. <laughs> For those of you who did not raise your hands, and I suppose you're humans, um, we also have very good news, and that's what Maria and I will be telling you about, the new treatments that we have been developing and that we're going to test now in humans here at the University of uh, Michigan. So this is who we are, and this is the title of the talk. And this is what we think, what you see here in the title is what we think is going to provide an improvement in the treatment of this deadly disease. So what is this disease that Marie and I are working on? So we're working on the disease, it's, it's brain cancer. The official name is glioblastoma multiforme. And this is really the worst type of brain tumor that anyone can get. Why is it so bad? If you look here at the image of an MRI, this is the MRI, it's the picture of the brain of a patient. You can see on the left the white structure on the left side of the blue image. And you can see what you see, the white in the middle of the brain is the cancer growing in the middle of the brain. And that's why it's so bad, because it's destroying brain structure. And that is what gives the symptoms. The other very um, terrible thing about this disease, and you can see that in the images on the right, on the left image, on the left white image, you have a red arrow that shows a tumor that was detected incidentally. So it wasn't known that this was a brain cancer, and the patient really didn't have any symptoms. However, because of the finding, the patient was followed. And as you can see on the right, again, if you look at the red arrow, now the brain tumor has grown, grown enormously, and it has grown so much in less than three months. So it grows very rapidly. It destroys important parts of the brain. So how have we done as a community in developing new treatments for this serious disease? We have statistics that go back 75 years. And 75 years ago, patients used to survive approximately six to nine months after the diagnosis. Nowadays, they survive between two years, maybe two and three years. So you can see that the survival over the last 75 years has only increased by 15 months. The reason that you, some of you will not be able to read how much the improvement was over the last 75 years, because this improvement was really very small. If you do the math, it comes down to only six days per year that we have been able to improve this, this disease. So definitely, we need new treatments for this disease. This disease can happen to anyone. This is a, an image of Senator Kennedy, who died, uh, sadly, of uh, brain cancer, the exact type that Marie and I are developing new treatments for two years ago. So the disease attacks adults. It attacks children. It doesn't respect socioeconomic status, race, or anything else. Uh, what you see here is actually what happens uh, to the actual patients. In the image on the left, you can see the tumor that was detected in a patient. Um, in the image of the middle, you actually see in the, in, the red, in the red circle the hole that is left in the brain after the surgeon takes out the tumor. However, even in spite of the patient being treated with radio and chemotherapy, on the right, you see that several months later, the tumor has come back. And that's why you see this white image in, in, in the brain again. Um, the disease can be very virulent in children because it attacks, if you look again at the red circle, it attacks the center of the brain, an area called the brainstem. And this is the area that controls your consciousness, your breathing, your heart rate. Essentially, it, it lets you be a human being. And because it attacks this brainstem, you can't even do surgery. This is a region of the brain you can't even touch or take out, because if you do, people would immediately die. So these are the, this is the disease. And Maria is going to tell you how we're going to cure it. 
Okay, so the approach we decided to take to provide a new treatment for this disease is called gene therapy. And gene therapy, many of you in the, in the audience might have read in the newspapers, but as a summary, is using DNA as medicines. And what is DNA? DNA is the genetic code, which is located in the nucleus of all our cells, and it's what dictates uh, the makeup of who we are. So that DNA can be cut and pasted, and you can see here the image on the left, that's a portion of DNA, and you can use some of these uh, genes as therapeutics. So once you've cut the gene and you've identified the gene that you would like to use, that gene has to be packaged to be delivered into humans. And uh, the packaging system that we decided to uh, use in the lab is called a gene therapy vector, and we use viruses. Why do we use viruses? Viruses have evolved over millions of years to infect humans and other species and deliver their genetic material into the infected cells. Thus, they're very, very efficient. So what we did is we took out all the genes that cause disease and we replaced them by the therapeutic genes. And the way these genes are packaged, they have to be scaled up. And you can see the image on the right the gene therapy vectors that we produce in the lab. We don't scale them up for human use in the lab because they have to undergo very stringent quality control. So they've been scaled up at Baylor College of Medicine. They have arrived at the University of, Me of Michigan last week. And the way this is going to happen in humans is that they're going to be loaded onto syringes and then they're going to be transported to the operating theater where the neurosurgeon would have taken the brain tumor out and then we'll go into the tumor cavity and very uh, gently deliver these gene therapy vectors. Which are the um, genes that we have decided to use to treat this disease? We have decided to use two genes. One gene is a killer gene, but it will kill specifically the cancer cells. And the other gene is a gene that will stimulate the immune system. And the way this will work is the vectors, as you can see um, with the syringe, are going to be delivered into the tumor cavity. Then they're going to kill some of the cancer cells, and they're going to train the immune cells, which have been inert in the body, to come back into the brain cancer. These cells are going to then take up any pieces of tumor cells that remain in the tumor cavity, and they're going to go back out of the brain into the draining lymph node, and they're going to train the T cells. You see a single cell at the bottom of the image, and these cells are going to expand, and they're going to be specific for the tumor. And for, they, for them to be active, these now expanded killer cells have to go back into the brain and kill any remaining tumor cells. How does this happen in real life? You see to the left uh, an image of a human a brain which has a GBM, and those are the darker areas, and you see different uh, foci of tumor, so it's a very difficult tumor to treat. This has been modeled in rodents, and you see the two images to the left. One rodent which has not been treated, you have a very large tumor mass and a satellite smaller mass, and this rodent will die due to the tumor burden. The animals that have been treated, which is the image uh, to the right, you see that both the large tumor mass and the satellite mass have completely disappeared. And this is an indication that the therapy not only kills the cancer cells, but the immune system can come back into the brain and recognize and eliminate the tumor mass that has not been treated. Now, Pedro will explain to you how the clinical trial will take place. So um, the, first, the first clinical trial, which we, is due to begin here at the University of uh, Michigan, hopefully within the next um, couple of months at least, is the first uh, human clinical trial of this combined strategy of the tumor killing and the immune stimulation with the particular um, detail that what we are doing is telling the immune system what the particular antigens are, telling them what the tumor looks like, and reconstituting the immune system in the brain and giving back to the brain an immune system it normally doesn't have. Um, it really has been, as you see below, a very, 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 very long and winding road. We started the work um, in the late 90s when we were actually uh, working in England. And uh, 2013, this is this year, we are going to start the first clinical trial, which was approved uh, by the FDA uh, within the last year. So how um, is this going to work directly in the patients? 
What you see here, this is a slice of a brain of a patient that sadly died from the disease. But essentially what you can see on the right side of this brain, where you see the yellow arrows, the hole that you see is the cavity that is left by the neurosurgeon when they remove the tumor. And the yellow arrows that you see there, those are the syringes that we are going to use to inject the area that is right next to the cavity. The, the, the area that is right next to the cavity is where we think that the cells are left that are going to start growing again and are going to kill the patient. And that's why this is where we're injecting the vector. And the arrows symbolize the syringes that Maria was telling you about, loaded with the vectors that will be injected into the brain. Our clinical trial is already cited on uh, clinicaltrials.gov that you see down below. And once a clinical trial starts, uh, you will be able to follow how it's going really almost online. So we haven't done this um, ourselves, uh, Maria and uh, myself alone. We've had uh, many people working with us over many places that we've been in the world. And yes, we like traveling as well. So we started <laughs> this work in Manchester, UK, actually not very far from where the Beatles wrote the lyric for that song. Um, after that, the weather in, uh, in England was really dreadful. Uh, it took us 15 years to realize that. <laughs> uh, we're a bit slow, but we eventually get there. So we went to LA, and there the weather was too nice. Um, <laughs> we realized that in only 10 years. And now we are back here in, in Ann Arbor, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the weather. <laughs> We've had the names that you see here are the names of the people who have been part of our teams in England, in LA, and now in Ann Arbor. And what you see below is the clinical trial teams, and it's a plural, because some of those names that you see are the people who helped us for the last 15 years to do all the basic work and to submit it to the FDA and get it approved by the FDA. And then hopefully um, the department, together with the Department of Neurosurgery, uh, Dr. Murashko, the chair of the department, together with Dr. Sager and Dr. Heth and Dr. Oringer, are going to take on and do this trial in humans. And it's huge teams. It's not only the neurosurgeons, it's the neurologists, the uh, radiologists, and lots of other people that help us with this. Again, not only couldn't we have done it without the people, we couldn't have done it without the funding. Uh, very generous funding from the National Institutes of Health that has funded our work um, since we've been here in the United States. Um, phase one, it's a philanthropy in Los Angeles that is funding the actual clinical trial that is going to begin now. And again, without them, we couldn't do the clinical trial that's going to start. And here in Ann Arbor, we've also been supported very generously by Phil Jenkins to do the work that we are doing. Now, there's no ending slide here. We think that the adventure of developing a new treatment for brain tumors is going to continue. Um, it's a long struggle, and it will be continuing to be a very exciting adventure to which we have dedicated our lives. Again, we are a team, and we are looking for people who, if you want to be part of a team as graduate students, postdocs, uh, mathematicians, Especially we need psychics who can actually predict how the future is going to work. Uh, please contact us. You have your emails there, and we'll be around during lunch hour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.